Commonwealth's attorneys and I have concluded that the NCAA sanctions were overreaching and unlawful. Someone's got to develop a product you and I as a consumer are going to want to buy. The country needs a comprehensive energy. Welcome to WHVL's For the Record. Our guest today, John Ziegler of The Framing of Paterno. John, welcome back to part two of For this the Record. This is wonderful having so much opportunity to actually speak. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not used to that when it comes to TV interviews. Well, in, in, in the first part, we discussed all of the, the events that led up to you starting the website, which is... FramingPaterno.com. And the mini-movie, which is... The Framing of Joe Paterno, which is meant figuratively, not literally. Right, so it's more artistic than it is the actual... Right, uh, I don't believe in conspiracies. Right. So... To review quickly, Jerry Sandusky is a pedophile. <laughs> You're convinced of that. You don't think he's innocent. No, I don't okay. think he's innocent, but I don't believe, I think there's grave question as to the type of pedophile that he is and whether or not he was guilty of some of the most heinous crimes or the most horrendous allegations against him, which is important, not because I'm trying to exonerate Jerry Sandusky. Which is where, if I were on the national stage, I would say, see. Right, right. exactly. Right. No, but it's important because that's important for context to understand how is it that he got away with his behavior for so long and why it is that Penn State and Joe Paterno didn't act more strongly in, in trying to crack down on that behavior. Because I think he was riding that line of plausible deniability in a very expert fashion for a very long time, largely because I think there is grave question. I, I can't be sure. But gun to my head, life on the line, did Jerry Sandusky ever have actual sex with these boys? I'm saying no, based upon my three and a half hours of interviews with him, my letters with him, my numerous conversations with Dottie, my looking at the evidence here. And again, the purpose of that assertion is not to try to exonerate Jerry Sandusky. It's to try to put it in context to understand how this story transpired the way that it did, and most specifically, why it was that Joe Paterno was not culpable in these crimes and why he was railroaded by the media and by the Board of Trustees at Penn State. Are you the only person who's been able to interview uh, Mr. Sandusky yet from uh, prison? Yes. I mean, I, and I'll probably be the last person. I, I certainly think I'll be the last person that will be able to inter interview him for three and a half hours of recorded material. Now, talk about the team you put together to, to create Framing of Paterno, the mini-movie. Well, it depends on what you mean. I mean, we have a, a lot of contributors on our website. As far as a team, a lot of people from here in State College who probably don't even want their names mentioned because because <laughs> of the controversial nature sure. of the of the of the project have been very passionate about trying to well, help there me are get the truth behind out. the scenes that are people on right. the screen as well and one of the people is Anthony Lebrano who's right. been very outspoken about the entire situation and, yes. and he and also Franco Harris who has been incredibly outspoken right. uh, they're two of the people who are in yes. the mini movie a lot yeah. let's yes. talk about okay, that okay that yes so Anthony Lebrano's in the mini movie Franco Harris is in the mini movie um, you know, several other people that are in the Mooney movie that, are, that play important roles. Rashard Casey, I think, plays an important role in this all, all this because it, he, his story blows apart the whole notion that Joe Paterno cared about negative publicity. If you know the Rashard Casey story, you know that was ridiculous. Well, go into it a little bit more detail. Talk about yeah, the Rashard Casey, that Rashard had to go into. Rashard Casey, a year before the, the, the McQuarrie episode, um, is basically accused of, uh, of uh, assaulting a police officer in an, in an invalid accusation, an accusation for which he would eventually get paid money. And not a state money. college, Pennsylvania, right. uh, policeman, it's somebody in New Jersey. Right, and he would eventually get paid six figures as a settlement for that inaccurate accusation. Well, I, ironically enough, as a talk show host in Philadelphia at the time, was attacking Joe Paterno for, for saying, what are you doing here? Why are you standing by Richard Casey? He, Paterno was getting clobbered at that time for doing that. But he did it because he thought it was the right thing because he didn't care about the media coverage. And, and Richard Casey tells that story in the mini movie in a way that I think is very powerful. And by the way, the Paterno report uses uh, the Richard Casey story to, to prove the exact same thing, that this Louis Free notion that Joe Paterno cared about negative publicity was just ridiculous. There's no proof for it. Let's do a compare and contrast with the Free report and also the Clemente report. Well, the, the Free report is a joke. I mean. Uh, First of all, the Free Report did not, re for all intents and purposes, didn't speak to any of the people who were intricately involved in the story. They technically spoke to Graham Spanier, but it was four or five days before the report was put together. They used, I think, a couple of sentences just to show that they, they put it in there. For all intents and purposes, Graham Spanier's not in there. So other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? I mean, how in the world do you do a report when you haven't spoken to any of the people involved? I have no idea. Then they, they use... And a, a scant amount of evidence 
to come to conclusions that are unbelievably dramatic. I mean, to me, when you take a look at the proportion of the nature of the allegation, which is like a 10 on the on the moral or immorality scale, sure. and the nature of the evidence, which was about a one out of 10 on the scale of what kind of evidence would you expect to exist in a case like this? It's unbelievable, especially with regard to Joe Paterno. We don't have one email from Joe Paterno. We don't even have an email with Joe Paterno's name being used. We, we are presuming that Coach refers to Joe Paterno, which is plausible, but that's an email written by Tim Curley vaguely referencing the 1998 investigation. We, we haven't even heard from Tim Curley as to what that meant. or what, Did he talk to Joe? Did Joe really know? You also have to remember this obviously was a, a rather elderly man, Joe Paterno, at this time. And in 1998, I think one of the many problems in this case is that 98 only looks like a huge deal in retrospect. Sure. At the time, and that was one of the most startling things about my interview with Jerry Sandusky. Folks, believe whatever you want about Jerry Sandusky. I am positive that in Jerry Sandusky's mind, the 1998 investigation was not a big deal. I know that seems impossible for us to believe now, but in his mind, it was over like that. He was told it was not a big deal. He, there was one interview with an investigator in the weight room, uh, a conversation with the mother, a phone call, and a notice in the mail saying that the allegation was unfounded. That was it. And, and it had nothing to do with his retirement. Uh, and I've gone into great deal with him in detail with him about the, the, the uh, University of Virginia job offer, which occurred in 2000, which to me blows apart the whole notion that after 1998, he was somehow known as a pedophile and that there was this whisper campaign, oh, don't hire Jerry Sandusky. That's just not true. In, in fact, if the New York Jets don't lose their last three games of the 2000 season, I believe there is no Penn State scandal because Al Groh doesn't call Virginia in the middle of Jerry Sandusky's second interview and say, I want the job because I'm going to get fired by the Jets, which I'm almost certain, I know Jerry believes happened, and the facts bear this out. Jerry would have been the head coach at Virginia, which, by the way, had a huge series of connections with Penn State. Right. Jay, Jay Paterno had been a graduate assistant there. George Welsh had been a coach at both schools. If, if any school was going to be protected by a whisper campaign, it was the University of Virginia. That didn't happen because there wasn't one. Good stopping point for us. You're watching WHVL's For the Record. Back with more John Ziegler after this. Welcome back to WHVL's For the Record. Our guest is John Ziegler. John, you've done the Sandusky interview, three and a half hours, and then you make the New York trip to be in the media. And the first place you sit down it was with Matt Lauer right. and immediately Matt Lauer reads to you a letter uh, from the Paterno family saying that they want nothing to do with you <laughs> basic well, in essence you know that's the Reader's Digest version Fine, sure. but you know it, it said that they they believe that you're not helping Joe's cause right. you know so that they immediately the media takes to that that you're an incredible uh, reporter on right. everything so talk about that situation did you know that letter was coming out um, I wasn't shocked by that because um, Scott Paterno, first of all, let's be clear, this was Scott Paterno. Um, Scott Paterno and I have had a lot of correspondence about this entire situation. Uh, I have a record of that correspondence. That correspondence will eventually be revealed at the right time, and I think people will have the proper context for why Scott Paterno did what he did. Uh, I think it was a mistake. Uh, Scott had already been, you know, saying his piece on Twitter, and I guess he realized that that wasn't going to have enough of an impact. So. I believe for political reasons and for reasons that were based in both ego and ignorance and not a pursuit of the truth, Scott decided to try to sabotage my efforts. Um, ironically enough, it may have been the most effective uh, gambit that he has done since the beginning of this entire situation. Not too many of them have been effective. Uh, I've made that clear this, to Scott that I believe that he is a, uh, has a, an important role to play in this entire story, both as Joe's lawyer, he refers to Joe as his client, which I find a little odd, sure. since it's his dad, his father, um, right. and he was also a huge part of the PR response. So Scott Paterno is part of this story. He's an incredibly important part of this story. Uh, and as someone who's trying to pursue the truth of this case, um, Scott Paterno is, has an incredibly important role to play in, in my evaluation of what really happened here. And um, I frankly think Scott's a little afraid of me. And I'm sorry that he feels that way, but he might actually have reason to be afraid of me because I don't care about kissing the backside of the Paterno family. I want to find out what happened here. Joe Paterno said, I want to know what the truth is. 
And I happen to be in a better position to find out what that truth is than anybody else, largely because I've spoken to people that no one else has. And I have no agenda here other than the truth. I'm not trying to make money out of this. I'm not going to make money out of this. My career is going to be destroyed by this. Uh, so all I want is the truth. And I'm sorry that, you know, Scott Paterno apparently is no longer interested in the truth. Well, you did that episode with uh, Matt Lauer and today. Then you step into uh, Pierce Morgan's uh, yeah. gun sights. And um, uh, he was just downright rude. Uh, whether he agreed with you or not, he was just rude to you. Well, I was set up there. Um, and, and I, and, and let's, let's go into great detail about that. Well, because here's what happened. If you watch it, and it's available on YouTube, you can watch the whole yeah. thing. You definitely got sandbagged. Did you know Sarah Gannon was going to be on with you? Well, here's what happened with Sarah Gannon. Um, I actually suggested when they wanted the CNN said they wanted the first primetime interview. I said, okay, why don't we do this? First segment, Piers and me. Second segment, bring on Sarah in studio and we'll debate this. I wanted to have a discussion with Sarah Gannon about this. We were told that Sarah Gannon at first said, let's see about my schedule, blah, blah, blah. And then a producer told the person who was working as my publicist at the time that she wants no part of this. And I actually tweeted her and I said, Sarah, how come you're not going to be on the show? She responded by saying, I never considered being on the show. This is before the show happens. Then we get to the studio and we're told Sarah will be appearing in the second segment via satellite. And the way it was being set up was she was going to get to have the last word on me after I was discarded with. And I didn't want that. In fact, I almost bailed on the show. So I went into that knowing I was being set up. And then it was very clear right from the start that not only Piers Morgan had an agenda, but Piers Morgan didn't have a clue about the facts of the case. I mean, if there's, if there's one thing oh, I... No, no, let's stop you right there. I watched that interview. He knows fully well that you're supporting Jerry Sandusky and the fact that he's a pedophile. <laughs> that's exactly what he said. To, I mean, that's what he accused you of right. when he was Which, on camera. I was baffled that he could not comprehend the distinction between defending Joe Paterno and defending Jerry Sandusky. In his mind, those were the two, two of the same things, which I found amazing. So, so anyway, the bottom line of this whole situation was I was in an impossible set of circumstances. So what I decided to do was, you know what? At the very least, I'm going to expose Piers Morgan individually and the media as a whole for having no clue about the facts of this case and having an agenda that they won't even let somebody... I just did the interview of the year on this subject by far. I mean, no one's ever gonna do an interview with Jerry Sandusky the way that I did. Incredible revelations. I'm waving the statement of victim two of the day that Joe Paterno was fired, saying nothing happened in the shower, that Mike McQuarrie is not telling the truth. By the way, in the commercial break, Piers Morgan doesn't even ask to look at the statement. Not, not even, couldn't be less curious about what happened. You know, I did that on the Today Show and on CNN primetime. You know how many media inquiries I got asking, because we hadn't revealed it on the website, framingpaterno.com yet, the victim two statement. You know how many inquiries I got? Zero. Not one member of the media even bothered to say, hey, could we see that? Can you give us some more information on that? That seems like interesting evidence. Not one. Why? The reason was because they don't want to know what the truth of this case well, and, is. And the other part of when you were doing those interviews, that they, they went after you for letting the name of victim oh. two out to the public. Well, that, that whole fiasco was incredibly insane. Here's what really happened with that. I had every intention of providing the name of victim two, not because I want to out a victim. Victim two outed himself. He wrote public letters to the editor in local Pennsylvania newspapers in his own name as a 24-year-old married sergeant in the Marine Corps, not as a child, uh, saying, don't believe the accusers. Jerry Sandusky was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. In my mind, and I spoke to others about this, he loses any right to anonymity at that point. But at the last moment, Jim Clemente, the Paterno family sex crimes expert, calls me on my way to the, the Piers Morgan interview and says, I've rethought this. Can you protect the name of victim two? I said, why? And he said, well, because I understand he's having some, he's really concerned about this. I said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Long story short, I said, have him call me or contact me. If he can explain to me why he deserves anonymity, I'm happy to try to help him out. Well, somehow the media turns that into, I am blackmailing victim two into he has to do an interview for my documentary? Are you kidding me? That, that's not even close to what happened. And then I decide, trying to be the nice guy and improving no deed goes unpunished, I will prevent his name 
from being in the article. Well, we had a mistake when we published it that for 15 people might have seen what his name was, and we got attacked by a cyber attack, which we've proven there was absolutely an attack at that exact moment, which prevented us from taking it down more quickly. But the reality is, if you Google his name, Victim 2 does not come up. And if you go in the opposite direction, you Google Victim 2, his name does not come up. There was no damage done. I have gone way beyond what I needed to do to try to protect his identity. Let's stop right there. You're watching WHVL's For the Record. Back with more John Ziegler right after this. Welcome back to WHVL's For the Record. John Ziegler. Do you think the media storm that you ran into had anything to do with your last documentary about uh, media malpractice? Is this payback? <laughs> um, I don't believe in conspiracies, but I do believe that... Uh, well, especially being, with NBC and, you know, your encounters with Nora well, O'Donnell. And, uh, well, you know, it's that. funny. Um, <laughs> I did an interview with Matt Lauer on the Today Show for my last documentary, was, which was about the 2008 presidential election. I am a political conservative. Uh, and that actually featured an interview, the only interview Sarah Palin ever did extensively about the 2008 election, which is why the Today Show had me on. And at that time, Matt Lauer called me a conservative documentary filmmaker, which is basically code for don't believe this guy. Sure. Um, I graduated with the Sandusky interview from conservative documentary filmmaker to controversial uh, documentary filmmaker, which I've noticed other media outlets have followed suit with. So I, I've gone from conservative to controversial, which again is code for don't believe anything this guy says because we don't like what he has to say. Um, look, I don't think it's payback, but I do know that I would be treated differently if I was a liberal. If I was a liberal and done the films that I've done, first of all, I'd be famous. And if you're famous and a celebrity, you get treated completely sure. differently than if you're not famous. As a non-famous person, I've got two and a half strikes against me on this story. Now, in that sense, does that make you too much of a lightning rod to really push the message of what you're trying to do in the framing of Paterno? Depends on what you think the, the goal is. See, a lot of people think that, I, I know there are a lot of Penn State people who think, oh, I, I like what he's doing, but his tactics or I make me uncomfortable. Well, um, as I've told Franco Harris, uh, you know, Franco needed a blocking back. Uh, and, you know, Rocky Blyer did a heck of a job for, for Franco. Right. And, um, and sometimes you've got to get uh, down and dirty in, in, the, in the line, and somebody has to take the blows, right, to open up the holes for other people. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the way I see what I've been trying to do, is I, I'm happy to be the Rocky Blyer. I'm a little disappointed, though, that when Rocky Blyer has gotten injured on the field, no one wants to help him off the field here. Um, it has been, no one's sent a stretcher for me, um, and, and, and the first aid has been rather lacking. Uh, so I'm a little disappointed in that, but there's, everyone's got a role here, and I was willing to sacrifice myself and did sacrifice myself. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that it might have been to no avail. Well, no, but Franco has been out there very out front, actually went, went and visited uh, Mr. Emmert at a public meeting, talked to him about the sanctions. I mean, he's out there on the forefront of well, Franco's been great. Right. I, I mean, in fact, in my opinion, um, ironically, two, the two people who have gotten the worst publicity, worst media coverage in this entire affair, other than obviously Sandusky, were Franco Harris and Joe Paterno. And when I look at all the people, and I've studied this as closely as anybody, who acted honorably and who acted dishonorably in this whole deal, in my opinion, the two people who acted the best were Joe Paterno and Franco Harris. And I find that to be quite remarkable, that the media has attacked the most the two people who deserve the most credit in this entire sad, sordid affair. One light at the end of the tunnel is the fact that Bob Costas has uh, agreed, I guess, to, to look at everything again and, and give it new light, possibly. Well, I've spoken to Bob Costas twice about this on the phone. I have given him the entire transcript of the Sandusky interview. I have made it clear to him Bob, I'm not a celebrity, so I'm not going to be able to get this thing done. You're a celebrity, and so you got a shot. He understands that. However, um, I think Bob's in a very difficult spot because with big celebrity means big risk. You have a lot to lose. And so I think that Bob will do an honest job of trying to reopen the free investigation, but I don't think that Bob's going to be in a position to, to actually be proactive about this and say, you know, this was a real wrong. Uh, Certainly not with his current employer. No, I mean, you see, I think that, unfortunately, the media wall that they've put up on this thing is so strong and so high. They don't want to take another look at this. Uh, that's why they destroyed me the way that they did, uh, because their credibility is on the line. I think deep down they know they blew this. I think they do know that. And that's why they react so strongly. You know, it's funny. 9-11 conspiracy people get treated better than than I do, 
Why? Sure. Why? Because they know the 9-11 conspiracy people are nuts and they have no real credibility. The reason why they destroy me is because they know I'm telling the truth. Deep down, they think I'm right. Is that why Mark Schwartz walked away from you on, on oh, the field of Beaver Stadium? Yeah, I mean, why would Mark Schwartz do that? I mean, if, if you're Mark Schwartz and, you know, and, I'm, and I'm full of it, right? Would that, was that the way you would react? And people can see that at our website, framingpaterno.com. It's in our mini movie. I think that was a very telling moment. And I think Mark Schwartz got exposed and ESPN got exposed. So where do we go from here with, it's a mini movie right now. It's in film festivals? Yeah, currently? we've been in several film festivals. We're hoping to maybe be in more, maybe in this area in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, we, Franco Harris has been screening it uh, throughout the, the East Coast. I don't know whether or not we can do a larger film because the media wall is so great. It would take such an enormous promotional budget to make an impact on this that I just don't know that that support is there. It's possibly a book, though. I'm actually thinking more along the lines of a book at this point than I am as a, a full-length documentary feature. But I'm going to stay on the story because no one knows this story like I do because no one has spoken to the people that I have. What do you see coming from the Schultz and Curley trial? My gut tells me that trial's never going to happen. I, and I could be wrong. It's just a purely gut instinct. I think that eventually the Cynthia Baldwin situation is going to torpedo that case. And if the prosecution is smart, they're going to use that as a way of washing their hands up. Oh, they got off on a technicality. We were right. We just couldn't prove it. Uh, it's not our fault. That would be a face-saving way because I don't think there's any way in the world the perjury charges in that case stick. Even, by the way, even if they were guilty, which they're not, in my opinion, I don't see how you get the perjury charges to stick based upon the evidence. When do you decide to not do a film and go to a book? What's the time well? For that it, um, it depends on the circumstances. I mean, I, it's a, I'm making decisions based upon day-to-day -day, uh, uh, situations. I will stay on the story because there's too many people who have been incredibly supportive of me, and I feel a, an obligation to them. The website again, John? www.framingpaterno.com. John Ziegler, thank you very much for being a part of the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you for watching WHVL's For the Record. We hope to have more newsmakers in the future. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.